Good morning, Australian time, and good evening, Minnesota time. Uh, can you hear me well? Okay, great. It's 10.59. Oh, I'm wearing a Dali shirt, if anybody's wondering. <laughs> Big eyes. Okay. I think we're all set up. Well, welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Nils. Probably have met some of you, and um, I'm currently at an art gallery in Melbourne, Australia, because uh, I'm an art teacher, and my students are having their final art show on Friday. So we're here setting up. And I'm taking a, a little break to be with you all, which is kind of a nice break, but also kind of stressful, like, oh, I gotta do all these things. So I just need to um, just be aware. And if you hear some noises of people hammering or doing gallery stuff, it's because um, people might be doing that. Okay. Um, are you all kind of regulars with this group with Mark? Kind of like, uh, it's pretty much, um, it's, a, it's a fairly new group, I believe. So I feel honored that he has entrusted me with your time. And um, we'll start our meditation. Um, do you usually meditate for 20 or 30 minutes? 30? 30 minutes? OK, beautiful. So uh, let's get started. I'll put a timer for 30 minutes. And um, as usual, I'm imagining that there are people who are um, quite experienced meditators and people who are in between and all around. So if we can just uh, roll up our shoulders three times one way and three times the other way. And just a, um, just a very gentle spinal twist, one side. And if you're physically able, take a deep breath in, deep breath out, back to center. And if this is comfortable for you, you do it. Otherwise, it's completely optional. Just do a little spinal twist on the other side. And uh, just to get us grounded, let's do a little bit of wrist rolls. Other way, and this is my favorite. You put your fingertips on your shoulders, and with your elbows, you go all the way front, all the way to the sky, all the way back, and all the way down twice more. And three times the other way. I call this the cheapest massage in town. It helps loosen up a little bit of the shoulders here. And uh, to start by gently closing your eyes, if that feels good. And um, in the scriptures, it, when they talk about bhavana or cultivation of the mind, it doesn't say you must always be silent in your mind, like no discursive thinking. In fact, you can use discursive thinking um, in your practice. So we'll do a little bit of a Sila Bhavana, just the recollection of the precepts to get us started. And just noticing and acknowledging the privilege that we have. If this week we were not in a situation where we had to kill someone to defend our family, to defend our space, because we were sent by an army. And what a blessing it is to have a life where one doesn't have to murder or kill. Where if you were raised in a safe environment, you know, I come from a country where gang violence is, was just the norm. And so children were taught to kill in my country. And so, 
However, dukkha, whatever we have, just to take in the blessing for a moment, that if we are able to keep the precept of not killing, how beautiful that is. Yeah. And also, not stealing, if we have enough. If last week we didn't have children that were so hungry that you felt like you had to go and steal, right? And it's not about comparing the world or being, oh, all those poor people over there, but just, just to really acknowledge that if right now we're living a life where we don't have to take what is not given, that that is a blessing. When we look at sila, what speech do we have? And sometimes our emotions are quicker than our speech and we say things that are hurtful. But again, if we're in a situation where we don't have to lie, or we don't have to deceive in order to survive, to take that in, that even though life can be really hard, We have some awareness of our speech. Just to be thankful for it. And if you are in recovery and you know what it's like to have an addiction, or if you have loved ones and you have seen the pain of uh, intoxicants, you know, when people are self-medicating, if uh, last week we were able to live a life where you were not using substances that cloud your mind, because if you're so intoxicated, you can break every other precept. Yeah. And we, if we haven't um, used our sexual energy in harmful ways to again take that in so much suffering happens and sexual energy is not used in good ways so there's this beautiful energy that we have with this body and to acknowledge that if you haven't caused anyone any harm just last week just to take that in and to make a commitment to do better, if we have the privilege of having a life where the five precepts are easy, then that opens the door of generosity. And you can then speak in kind words, you can then cherish life. And this sila bhavana is something that uh, in Buddhist countries is done. When I was a monk, we had confession every two weeks. And so just, you know, the full moon and new moon, you can just take the five precepts and say, how did I do? Having shame in check, because this is not about bringing shame into our lives. But it's about having that foundation of the tripod in Buddhism where you have sila, you have samadhi, and you have panya, that wisdom, and you have meditation, and you have sila. There's so many kinds of meditations and to say, be quiet, pay attention to your breath. I mean, that's easy just to say it. And how we experience meditation, what our unconscious desires might be, like I want this meditation to be a certain way. Put that in check. And I'm going to 
invite you to try this meditation that I've been doing for a while now. And it's a kind of a body scanning, but doesn't go from the top of the head or the fingers. But it moves to the sensations that your body is giving you. It could be an ache and pain, it could be an itch. So pick the loudest sensation, as it were. Is it your right shoulder? It's like a growly tummy, sort of toothache. And find a pinpoint of this sensation. And with your awareness, travel out to see where that sensation ends. For some people, this may be easy. For some people, no, I can't really do it. But just playfully moving the sensations of your body. You know, there's so many arguments about how one should meditate. What is the sensation you can find? Your eyes, your head, your foot. And then follow that sensation. Or find the nearest spot to that sensation where that sensation is not felt. And then move on to the next one. You're just calming the mind. These sensations are your anchor. And we're not trying to change them. Sometimes you can be aware of the energy in your body. And actually, when I do this practice, sometimes the posture gets better. I feel like spontaneously my right shoulder will move. Or I notice that I'm slouching. So move around in your body. You can also move internally. Is there a sensation of how fast the heart is beating or how quickly the lungs are inhaling and exhaling? This doesn't work, just move to whatever regular practice you have. But see if you can, one way I see it as well is that I get a call from a part of my body because there's a sensation there. And if it's particularly unpleasant to notice how tricky it is to just notice the unpleasantness without trying to fix it. So now this is Rupa Bhavana, awareness of the bodily form. How is this body feeling?
Are the body sensations pleasant? Are they unpleasant? Are they neutral? Or is it both? If your body wants to do micro movements, or if your mind is quiet, you can focus on the energies inside of the body. We have a nervous system, and we have circulations. So we've got these roads inside of us. So electrical charges, there's fluids. Just go internally and see if any of those energies can be felt. And if not, just go to the muscles, the bones, and pinpoint where is the loudest sensation. And what is the neighboring part of the body where that sensation is not there? With this curiosity, with a very gentle awareness. This body works so hard, just giving it some loving attention.
And for the last few minutes, if we can all switch to Anapanasati, classic awareness of the breath. Noticing the belly, the nostrils, or the chest. Just finishing up with the breath, that which gives us life. And when you're ready, very gently opening your eyes if they were closed, coming back to the room. Let's take 60 seconds to do a little bit of stretching, move around if you need to. So, hello again. If you joined late, I'm Nils. I'm in uh, Melbourne, Australia at the moment, and uh, I've been a friend of Common Ground for quite a long time. And since I was visiting my mom last month, uh, Mark asked me to be here with you. Before I start speaking, I'm wondering if anyone has any uh, questions on the meditation or anything that you want to before I move on. Can you that practice? I'm getting memories of being a teacher on Zoom where I just sit through boxes during the pandemic. Okay. Well, um, you know, I've been practicing for quite a while and Recently, I've been thinking about um, lines of development. You know, Ken Wilber talks about, you know, you could be really brilliant academically or with your mind, with your brain, but not be emotionally competent. Or you might be very artistic, but not know how to meditate, how to reflect. 
And this tripod that early Buddhism presents with, you know, your behavior, your ethics, and the meditation part, and the wisdom, it's been interesting to me to see throughout the years, you know, over 30 years of pondering and practicing, and sometimes asking, okay, well, what, what have I gotten out of it? Do I still have beginner's mind? And um, this thing with the precepts, when I was in Thailand, the, some of the traditional monks used to say, what you teach lay people is generosity and the precepts. Everything else is for monastics. And I was like, huh. I, and I kind of found that a little bit condescending or kind of weird. But now that I've been a lay person for most of my life, to really ask, like, what is generosity for me? What is right speech? You know, because now with texting and with um, communicating is so complicated, yet it's supposed to be simple. And, you know, once you hit sent on that email, and how to guard that stuff. And really, now that I've lived a life where that has been an anchor, to know that I don't have that many regrets um, and the blessing that it is and that it's easier to meditate if, you know, if things that I've done are not coming up, like, you know, if I haven't stolen from somebody like that, um, the hindrances that you know about. In Pali, like, wichi kicha and uducha kukucha, and they used to make me laugh the way they sound. And, uh, and look at my attitudes with what wisdom and what meditation means because there are so many opinions on um, uh, second. hold on one second I was just getting a call from my school principal because again, it's uh, it's eleven thirty-five in the morning here, and so he has a pickup truck and he's bringing some of the big paintings to the gallery. That's what's happening. Um, yeah, and and uh, so meditation. You know, I I was very curious as to why the jhanas were not mentioned in a lot of circles, and the jhanas are the um, the states of mind that the a human being can go into when you don't have discursive thought. And this is not a Buddhist thing. It, Hindus know how to do it. Um, Catholics, I, you know, it's brought up Catholics, the mystics used to do the jhanas. But there's always controversies. You know, there are people in Sri Lanka, some Buddhists would be like, oh, nobody can do that. Or people will say it is a requirement to do the jhanas before you can get enlightened. And all of this stuff, you know, and I was like, why, why is it so controversial? And the reason is, is because they're very rare. But any moment that you are at peace and you allow the body to, um, to center, you can open the door. And I really don't like the translation of concentration that when you have samadhi it's called concentration because in english it has all of these um, different things that are not what relaxing and letting go in the moment is and so i i've it took me a long time to get rid of the accomplishing mind because it's so it sometimes is really obvious like, I want this meditation to be a certain way. But other times it's not, you know? And that's why um, doing a gratitude meditation or loving kindness um, can sometimes invite us to get away from that. And when we live in a capitalist society, you live in a consumerist society, it's just very common that if you're going to put effort into something, you should get something back. And when it comes to meditation, it doesn't work. It's not a linear thing. 
how do you, you know, what does letting go mean? Uh, I, I've always been very annoyed at meditation teachers who would say, oh, let go of this, now let go of that. I'm like, that sounds fine, but I don't have a switch somewhere where I'm like, okay, I just let go of that. You know, sometimes you can do that, but it's a process. Like, let go of your anger. The, you know, if it's an emotion, it is in the body. You can have an angry thought, and that's easy to let go of sometimes, because then you can think of a pink elephant. Okay, I have a silly thought, I let go of the thought. But when you're having other things, such as strong emotions or remorse, or... Um, or even let go of wanting the body not to be painful. Like, oh, yeah, how do I do that exactly? <laughs> like how, what, does that, what does that mean? And how do I process that? And how do I undo? Or how do I unlearn? And, you know, one definition of realization, when you have realized something, as opposed to thinking about it, is that there's a change of behavior. Well, that's also in psychology, the word learning, when you learn something, one of the classic definitions of learning is also a change of behavior. And are thoughts behavior, or do you actually have to be doing something? Like, you know, what does that mean when I'm living my life? But I've had realizations where um, something happens and I'm like, yep, yeah, I'm not going to do that anymore. You know, I will not punish people emotionally because I have felt insulted or um, I will not, you know, as a kid, silent treatments were my thing. And I remember the moment where like, nope, I'm never doing a silent treatment again. You know? <laughs> like, it, like, like that's something that just happened, but it, it came out of reflecting awareness, you know, how do I um, navigate this world? And sometimes, you know, with the precepts, there are some times when people, like, something drops, and I'm like, I'm not going to embezzle anymore. Like, uh, I know this lady in Minneapolis who embezzled just a little bit, just a little bit, for 30 years, ended up in jail. And so... I've seen the practice in different ways throughout the years. Like sometimes I feel like spiritual practice is telling me to grow up, grow up, you know? Other times is how can you be the most compassionate with yourself? And to take the time, it's so valuable in my life to know that when I'm stressed, like right now I'm feeling uh, a lot of stress because I have something personally happening and then the biggest event of the year is happening this week. And I just wonder if I didn't have my practice, um, I would have canceled this and be like, okay, I have other things to do, but I'm like, you know, there's things in my toolbox where I can be grounded. Um, want to open it up again for comments. Do you ever do breakup groups in this? I mean, I know it's a fairly new group, but do you ever have little discussions among yourselves? Is that a, it hasn't happened yet? Can someone let me know, or is there a chat? Yeah, usually when I go to Common Ground, I I'm, I enjoy inviting people to see how something is landing or how, when you hear something, what does it make you think of? So let's do um, a mini, and if you don't find this useful, then that's fine. But let me see. Uh, what I want you to do is to think about this tripod of sila samadhi panya and how you practice with it and it's just going to be um like three or four minutes 
Okay, so just talk to each other because I, I think there's a valuable thing to have a little reflections. So I'll put you into mini groups and the prompt is, um, how do you find Sila Samadhi and Panya as a dynamic in your life? Hey, I think everyone is back. Can you still hear me well? Feel good? Okay, beautiful. beautiful. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I remember being a teenager and reading, you know, about transcendental meditation and the Maharishi said, uh, the purpose of life is the expansion of happiness. And I was like, really? Is that... You know, and sometimes I still think about that, like how how does one define happiness? And uh, one of the things I've really enjoyed in Buddhism is the uh, the different realms of existence. And there's all these angels and demons, and and there's uh, gnomes and fairies and gods. And um, what's interesting is that, and I've talked about this in the past, is they go with a realm here on earth as well. And so there are angels who play music, right? So there's musicians. And then there are gods who just delight in the creation of other gods. And that's the art patrons who will just give a few million and then other people have to sing opera and other people have to learn ballet. And the environmentalists who are kind of, you know, forest beings. And then there's the people that are being tortured or in a, or in a hell, or people in addiction who are the hungry ghosts. And so we're um, kind of number five out of 33 realms. And the definition of somebody who's human is somebody who follows the five precepts. And, you know, if your preoccupation is just beauty or just refinement, you're kind of in this realm, but you could be an ogre who's immature, but also can be very destructive. And it can be quite fun to be an ogre. If you think of the, the, the kid who just destroys someone else's sandcastle, it's very immature, but it can be quite destructive and other people can follow ogres or you can be angelic and take care of other people's needs, but not your own. And so then there's no wisdom in some of those actions. Like I have an auntie who's a bit selfish. And then her younger sister, my other auntie is one of these, she lost her house in Santa Barbara. She's so generous that they didn't pay attention to their own finances, but they're some of the most generous people that I know. And so with Donna, again, it's like give at the right time to the right person with the right intention, the right place. Like there's this high standard and, and you're not going to give if it's going to hurt you. And for some people that can be really easy, right? Like it's not even, a, a, it's just second nature. And so you bring in the wisdom to say, how can I be generous to myself? Like the example, I remember living in Minnesota when it was winter and somebody had invited me to a dinner party. I'm like, oh, I have to go outside. It's dark. I have to clean my car. And I, and I just had to push myself. And to me, that was an act of generosity, like to go outside and be there for somebody. <laughs> Whether many times people think generosity is about money. And with meditation that now there are so many apps and it's a multi-million dollar industry. It wasn't like that when I started. Um, and people will be like, find a quiet spot. Like the planet is noisy. And if you have a quiet spot, that's rare and that's very nice. I mean, you can be in a suburb in Minnesota, right? And, and think that quietness is like, that's how the planet is, but it's not. So to, you know, in Bangkok, there's all these monks in the, in the loudness in India with all the honking. In India, people communicate by honking. Like, bleep, 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 bleep. like where are they going to find a quiet space to meditate? And so to demand that you have to have a quiet, you know, it's like, no. One of the, my favorite meditations is just to listen to the sounds of the world. In fact, I did that in Minneapolis, right? 
And so to continuously check, what is my, how is my tripod? How do I challenge myself in meditation? How do I be gentle with my meditation? And throughout the years, you know, there are times when I've meditated twice a day, just the fidelity of it, you know, just all the time. And other times I'm like, no, nope. at this point, I'm doing little five minute meditations or whatever, you know, like it's um, to know when, when to push oneself and to know when um, to do other mindful meditations. Like it's now almost five years that I've been counting my steps. I used to hate walking meditation, like really with a passion. When I when I learned walking meditation, I was like, this is not dancing and it's not meditating. What, what is this? You know, Tai Chi was the same thing because I love to dance. So meditating um, and, and, and just being grounded and, and to think it, it's such a lovely thing that you have also mindfulness as part of a, the equation where you can just live your life and um, have an anchor. I, that image I like because the anchor doesn't move, but the boat could be like here. So like there could be a big storm, right? But the anchor reminds you that at the bottom of the ocean, it's still calm. And so, you know, you continue with the anchor and rituals can be anchors. And in, in capitalist meditation stuff, many times it was just like, okay, now do something or come and listen to my talk. Like I, I find some of it is beautiful and some of it is a little off-putting to me. But this anchor where uh, in, in the tripod where you're, you're using something that holds your attention where you can rest. Sometimes I get the image of a clothes hanger and like, I'm like, I'm a shirt and I just like go boop and I'm just like, I don't have to do anything. I don't know this. I've never shared this, but for some reason, you know, when you're, I don't know if it makes any sense to anyone else, but like when you're wearing a shirt, the shirt is moving and all that. And all of a sudden the consciousness is just like, oh, I'm just going to hang. <laughs> it's just going to be like just the shirt hanging. Um, and this word allowing, I, Ajahn Sumedho, one of my teachers said, can we allow, what, what, is, what exactly is that? Like, what is the difference between allowing and resistance in my actual experience? Like, when, when do I know that I'm allowing? Like, at what point did that start? You know? Because some of the stuff, you know, when you've learned and unlearned things in your body, if you've got trauma, if you've got all these things, allowing is vulnerability. Like if you say allow for emotions to be in there, it's like that's a vulnerable space sometimes. You know, like if you say, oh, allow your memories to come in, allow your hurt to come in, like what, like what? And that's why that wisdom part, along with a meditation, is important. And I feel that sometimes just having an app when people are like, okay, I'm going to meditate. And, and many times they don't, they don't continue because meditating can be quite hard. It can be, it, you know, it can bring things up or just boredom. And I'm like, what, what am I doing this? I should be getting something and people just stop. And also if it never feels good, if meditation never feels good, then why would we continue? Like at some point we got to learn this is what I've learned in my practice too, is that what well, I've seen it in other people is that you don't need a teacher. Like all of a sudden, um, the meditation that you need sometimes appears, you know? And that's why different teachers will have, they will teach certain things because all of a sudden, they, you know, like I could close my eyes for a while, I, I would see all these lights and stuff. And it's kind of like when you're at the beach and you, and you have your eyes closed and you see maybe red and then you put your hand over and it kind of changes. So I would have these. But other people have sounds and other people do very specific kind of. So if you ever have something like that, where you're like, oh, I've just started meditating by using these beads and each bead represents something or I'm doing that, like pay attention to that. 
because many times those are the things that are easy when something when you when you meditate a lot uh, you're giving yourself the opportunity also to um, to have something come up you know like I, I used to use beads and it's 108 beads and I would think of 108 names of people that I've known in my life and that would be my meta and I wouldn't be repeating anything except their name so it'd be like Martita, Virginia, Erwin. And all I'm doing is saying their names, wishing them safety and happiness. And that was easy for me. I'm not doing that right now. <laughs> I'm not doing that practice. But there was a time when, when that just sort of appeared and it came from um, Ajahn V, one of my teachers, who also um, he used to do the metta with names. Um, so yeah well then one second i have my other teachers outside of the gallery who cannot get in so you just send a text message i apologize it's a little bit crazy at the moment um okay hey talk among yourselves while i go open the door um so again what's coming up for you and um uh, have a talk and I will I will be right back. Hello. Would anyone like to share um, what's been said either in group one or group two that might be interesting for all of us to hear? And there's no pressure, just wondering. Yeah, go ahead. I think you have to unmute. Okay, great. Um, yeah. Well, I was sort when we've had our first group, I was kind of following up on what you said about, um, you know, and I've I've thought this a lot myself is that it's one thing to to be able to get rid of thoughts, but it's it's quite another to be able to let go of an emotion of of a strong emotion. Um, yeah, and sometimes when I hear teachers talk about that, I, you know, I'm thinking, well, that's easier said than done. Um, but one of the people in my group said, you know, that for him, it was uh, letting go of, a, of, a, of an emotion was a matter of um, just letting it run its course. Mm -hmm. And that that's that's an interesting way and a helpful way for me to look at it. Beautiful. Yeah. Thank you. I like that. Yeah. Anyone else? Something you want to share that you heard, or that maybe you heard yourself say? Well, I can just share that in in the first group I was in. I think we talked a bit about how novel and in some ways interesting and helpful it was to focus on an area around a strong sensation, to find the area where we weren't feeling that sensation. And um, yeah, for me, that was pretty powerful because I hadn't done that before. And all of a sudden there was this empty, free space there where I actually wasn't feeling that sensation and I I wasn't aware to look for it in that way before I was aware to look for the sensations coming and going by focusing on the sensation itself but not to look for right around there where there was no sensation so that was something very interesting yeah yeah I mean, sometimes it's easy and sometimes it's not like, you know, sometimes I can't follow smoothly, but I can sort of like jump to the next one where I'm not feeling it <laughs> and then just kind of move back. So let's say I'm having a sensation here, then I'll go over here and then move and see if I can feel where it begins. Just allowing it and, and that, and then sometimes it happens that I'm like, oh, like my body does a little, ooh. <laughs> little thing or it does sometimes I call it the internal massage like internal massage 
where um, I'm feeling energies. And then when I'm doing that, it, you know, it gets so calm, just noticing the emotions that it does that, yeah. Well, I can open it up to questions then, not so much what you heard in your group, but, um, you know, I, it's funny, like this term Dharma teacher, I, like I'm an art teacher, and I think that's a ridiculous label. Like, how do you teach art? I mean, I can teach you a ceramic technique, and I can teach you aesthetics, and I can teach you, but like art is this weird term. And I think Dharma teacher is similar to me, where I'm like, uh, I, I can teach you something about the scriptures, and I can teach you my experience, but it's it's something that I don't think can be taught in some ways when I look at it expansively. So, um, but yeah, so I'm more like a peer that has practiced and I have some experience. So if you have some questions, um, I would welcome them. And we can finish early too. I mean, I have no pressure, but, uh, but if you've got something that's in your mind, either related to what I've said or to not, I uh, would be happy to uh, respond to them. I have a question. Yeah. Um, as you were talking about, and actually, I, 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 I did raise this point in our second small group. Um, but as you were talking about, um, uh if I'm using the right words here, but, um, you know, allowing different forms or methods of meditation to just kind of arise and, and um, uh, and, and it, you're, it might be this for a while, then it might be that for a while, and, and to let that sort of fluidity happen or express itself um that uh um <clears throat> when you first were speaking about that i felt a little resistance inside of me come up because um uh, well I, I think i actually was well I don't know if I was doing exactly what you were talking about, but what came up for me was this period of my practice where I was trying this and trying that and trying this and trying that. And it was still a lot of jumping around. And and I've found it much more helpful in my practice. Um, uh, um, onward leading, as they say, to, mm -hmm. to stay with the same practice um, and just keep returning to it again and again and again. I, I, I Even as I'm talking about this, I can hear the wisdom, though, of, of not clinging to that, you know, that I can, I can start clinging to that, too. And, 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 and there are so many forms of meditation that that, that the Buddha spoke of, but I, I'm, uh, yeah, I, I just wonder what else you might have to say about all of that. Yeah, yeah, you know, there, there's a, a saying of um, famous that if you try to dig a lot of shallow wells, you will never get the deep water, and so we have to you can use many tools to dig the same well, mm. right? And so whatever works for a person, it, like if you have something that has worked all along and you're not stagnating, you're not, um, you know, if it's something that like, why would you change it, right? Mm. What, what I was talking about is that when you're meditating a lot, there are some times where like the sound of silence for Ajahn Sumedho, that is something that Hindus were doing way before the Buddha, but he teaches it. You hear this kind of high pitched thing. And I know people that only do the sound of silence. 
Well, nobody in the Ajahn Chah tradition taught him that. Or in Northeast Thailand, they'll say Bhutto, repeat Bhutto, Bhutto. Well, that's not from the scriptures either. In the 30 meditation objects, in the Visuddhimagga, in this text, there's all of these varieties. And so I think the point that I, one of the points that I was making is that when you meditate a lot, sometimes the meditation that you need or the meditation that is easy appears. You see? And if you're so constricted about, I will only pay attention, I will only count my in breath and my out breath, and that's all I'm doing. And if that works, it's fine, but also you might not be in a place where what happens is, oh, I need to do forgiveness meditation. Sure. <laughs> yeah. And so I, what you're saying, I think, has a lot of value because what happens with the app, I call it the app meditation world, right? Like, oh, I'm going to try this one and now this time and I'm going to have this teacher. And then, and it's so superficial mm -hmm. that actually you're entertaining yourself. I went to a, a Monday meditation group here in Melbourne and I went three times and it was all about who could be more entertaining. Like somebody would bring drums and bells and a guitar and everybody would bring different chanting things. And it was, and, and nobody stayed silent, but it was almost competitive about who can have the, the, the most interesting meditation, right? I went to a Tibetan Buddhist retreat here as well, which is kind of fun. I was sitting at kangaroos going around and I'm like, wow, I'm really in Australia. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I couldn't connect with any of the meditations because they, they didn't do silent. You know, they're doing tantra, which is the, you know, you imagine yourself being a deity and, and they would say, now uh, blue nectar is coming through your head. And I'm like, what is this blue nectar? I <laughs> what is this peach nectar? Um, and so I think if I were to do the Tibetan meditation and then go to this and go to that. Um, so I, what you're saying, I think, has a lot of value because if you're a dilettante or you're, um, um, you also don't give yourself the opportunity to be challenged. Because if you stay with one thing, um, that again, that fidelity, that 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 commitment allows for certain things to arise that would never arise if you keep changing all the time. So I'm so glad that you said that because I, I it, it allows me to clarify that I, I wouldn't do that. But, you know, I've been meditating. I don't know what what's 54 minus 16. That's how long I've been meditating. 38. Thank you. You know, so so when I talk about this changing, I'm not talking about three months or three years, it's three decades, right? And and so there was a time when I was doing mudra meditation because my body was moving so much, and all of a sudden my hands would go into these positions. And now you can find mudra cards and mudra books, but when I was doing it way back then, I didn't know that it was a way for the energy to kind of escape. <laughs> And, and so what I meant is that, that I've discovered those things at different times of my life um, that have been very useful. Thank you for bringing that up. It's, it's, it's useful. And thank you for clarifying. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Ponderings? Why did you, why did you wear that t-shirt today? <laughs> well, um, you know, I'm doing this artsy thing and I, I bought it. I, I just woke up this morning and like, it'd be fun to have. I didn't think about this meeting. I was just thinking it's just a t-shirt too, because it's, it's going to be kind of a messy day, you know, putting stuff up and drilling. And so it's just kind of a fun t-shirt. Well, it's just really, it's, it adds a level of not absurdity, just it's a sort of the paradox or something of or Dali would have loved that, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. into it. I, you know, I I don't take myself very seriously because I just think here, let me show you my bunch box. I bought it, I bought it in Minneapolis. Oh.
<laughs> well, you can't take yourself seriously if you have a Hello Kitty lunchbox. And you know, I show up at work and I'm meeting with the other teachers, they just kind of look at it and they're like, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's fun. It's fun. I think a sense of humor, you know, everyone that I admire is humble and has a sense of humor, which I found interesting. You know, that humility is just like, humility is just like, I'm just here. I'm not pretending to be someone I'm not. I'm not trying to get you to like me. I'm just here. And, and then you just kind of like, there's all these galaxies and we're in this little planet. <laughs> like, that's kind of funny to me. It's just, you know, we have this body with all these millions of cells. The mystery of it all is, is really wild. And that's why, you know, I love this emphasis on dukkha. That it doesn't matter who you are, you suffer. And you deal with this suffering by having sila samadhi panya, which is the noble eightfold path divided into three. Right? So when you have the noble eightfold path and they talk about, you know, mindfulness and meditation, well, that is your samadhi. And then you have right speech and right livelihood, right? And that, that this kind of stuff is your sila part. And then you have the right intention and the right um, view. It's your wisdom. And presenting the Four Noble Truths as Ayurvedic medicine. It's like, we've got this disease. There's a cause for it. Just this craving and this ignorance. And the prognosis is that there's an there can be, there's an end to it, and and then they give you the prescription, which is see less body panya. It's been so useful, so useful. Um, and then everything else, you know, you can be so get so complicated studying this, and you know things like impermanence or whatever. Now. When I see somebody not being evil or being immature, then I just look, well, yeah, it's either ignorance or anger you know, or greed. And so then you have those antidotes that you have loving kindness, generosity, right? wisdom. And, uh, and if you continue to enrich those three legs of the tripod, growth can happen. Um, it's been an honor being with you. Um, we have time for one more question and then we're gonna close out. Well, one more comment. Seeing anyone else go up, so I'll... Um, yeah. I'll share. Thanks, Nil, so much. Um, so lovely to be with you. Um, we we talked in my group about. Um, I'm curious, and this is probably like a whole nother set of talks. Um, but kind of picking out a theme that you talk you spoke about. Curious to hear a little bit more about your thoughts of like when when to uh, kind of sit and be vulnerable with with emotions versus. Um, mm -hmm taking space from them and just being and and like always wanting to be kind of that neutral observer but when to just like let it be and not necessarily get curious about it and this theme that I like hadn't really thought a lot about around big emotions but several people brought it up of just letting it run its course and yeah. and maybe not like really taking an active round in it at all <laughs> yeah um that's a super rich question. And it's the wisdom part, right? Like at the discernment, that's the word that I like. Like at what point do you do you have to say, I need to invest on a therapist? Mm -hmm. I need therapy. Or what I need is journaling. And for the emotion to run its course, I need to do some writing. You know, like like that's 
that's where the wisdom where you have good friends and you can share with a friend and say, hey, I'm feeling this way. So I, you know, to be honest, I don't know uh, <laughs> and the answer to that question because it's a very rich question, but it's 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 something that we can continue to explore. And, and um, I, you know, the word safety also comes to me. The um, when emotions are so strong and, and all of this that we lose ourselves and we lose mindfulness. And you know you can dump on someone else, or you can do all this, or or you can repress the emotion. It's very complex. It's a very complex field, emotions, because they're being felt in the body, you know. And and uh, and so for it to run its course is different for different people. Right? Like for some people, it could be just sitting down, but some people could actually be running, like actually running and metabolize some of that. And when it's grief, sometimes grief will never ever run its course because you stay with it until you die. And, and so having its course doesn't mean get rid of. And that's, that's, that's a thing that can be subtle where you can say, oh, it really, well, run its course could mean I'm not feeding the anger. I'm not wallowing in the sadness. And so running its course can mean, okay, I it's the energy has lessened. So it's no longer registered in the body at this point. So thank you for coming along. Tell Mark that I behaved myself. And uh I, if you know me, I finish a lot of my talks by saying that whenever you work towards your happiness, you're honoring everyone that has ever loved you. You heal the ancestors and you inspire the young ones. So everyone that has ever loved you, what they wanted was for you to be happy. And so whenever you work towards your happiness, you're giving a gift to those people who might have sacrificed something for you, who were your family, your loved ones. And then when young people look at older people, they're like, oh, they look happy. It's possible for me. <laughs> so working towards your happiness is also incredibly good for the world because happy people are not mean. It's also something else I'll say. So thank you for being here and uh, enjoy yourselves. And uh, summer is coming here. You're coming for winter. So wish you well in the winter, <laughs> winter months. Take care.